If you're tired of these promos, supporters get the podcast early and ad-free. Just go to donate.bogosity.tv for the links to sign up. Welcome to the Bogosity Podcast for the week of June 21st, 2020. The podcast that's sitting here on the Group W bench. This is your host, Shane Killian. First, a quick announcement. Heather and I are finally going to be able to take our vacation this year. We'll still have to wear masks when we go out, governor's orders. But really, we won't be leaving the hotel room all that much. Anyway, that means no podcast for the next two weeks, so it'll return on the 19th of July. Now let's palletize the news of the bogus. Last time, we talked about the Supreme Court denying certiorari for all Second Amendment cases and how it might actually be a good thing. This week, we're looking at them denying cert for qualified immunity cases, but sorry, no silver lining this time. Qualified immunity is the absolutely horrible doctrine that police and other government agents can't be held responsible for what they do on the job. This isn't anything our founders came up with for some esoteric reason. It actually started in 1967. In the Civil Rights Act of 1871, Section 1983 allows any U.S. citizen to sue a state or local official in federal court for, quote, the deprivation of any rights, privileges, or immunity secured by the Constitution and laws. Occasionally, defendants were able to argue that their actions were immune from action because they were necessary to perform their duties, but these were built on a case-by-case basis, and generally the defendant had to show that the harm caused by the civil rights violation was less than the harm they were trying to prevent or correct for. But in 1967, the Supreme Court case Pearson v. Ray basically made qualified immunity the default, under the assumption that officials were considered to be acting in good faith. In 1982, Harlow v. Fitzgerald solidified qualified immunity for federal officials and gave us the current definition. They ruled that officials have this immunity because of, quote, the need to protect officials who are required to exercise discretion and the related public interest in encouraging the vigorous exercise of official authority. Government officials performing discretionary functions generally are shielded from liability for civil damages insofar as their conduct does not violate clearly established statutory or constitutional rights of which a reasonable person would have known. And then, Graham v. Connor in 1989 set up a test to determine if immunity applies. The first step is to consider if the force was unreasonable and unconstitutional. If it is, the second step is to determine if it is clearly established that the force is unconstitutional. Get it? You can pierce qualified immunity if you establish a precedent saying their action was unconstitutional. But how can you get a precedent if you can't bring the case forward to begin with? So it's a catch-22. In order for a case to go forward, you have to produce a precedent. But if no cases go forward, there can be no precedent. And the permutations of a situation are infinite. You will always be able to find a way that one case is different from another. And that brings me to one of the cases the court refused to hear, Baxter v. Bracey, where they let stand a Sixth Circuit decision ruling that immunity applied to a police officer who released a canine on a suspect who had already surrendered, sitting on the ground with his hands up. The Sixth Circuit said the precedent didn't apply because, in the precedent... The suspect was lying down, not sitting. And that makes it totes different. They have immunity, case no go forward. Notice that at no point did they actually address whether or not the conduct was a constitutional violation. Just like the case of Corbett v. Vickers, where SCOTUS let an 11th Circuit decision stand, granting immunity to an officer who shot a 10-year-old child in the back of the knee in an attempt to shoot a pet dog who was no threat. And unlike the split decisions last week, the only member of the court who would have granted cert to these cases is Justice Thomas. Gorsuch has claimed to support textualism and originalism, but apparently not when it involves going against the holy priests of government. So-called liberal justices like Sotomayor, Ginsburg, and Kagan are apparently fine with it, too. But really, qualified immunity is an invention of the Supreme Court. Why would we think there's any real chance of them going against the governmental power they themselves created? Add 
are annoying, but ad blockers prevent publishers from making money. What if you could support your favorite websites, YouTube creators, Twitch streamers, social accounts, and many more ad-free and without paying anything, and even make some money yourself? It's not a pipe dream, it's airtime. Go to airtime.bogosity.tv and get the browser extension and you'll earn cryptocurrency for the sites you visit, and so will the publisher. This is not a crypto miner. You and the publisher will both get part of the reward from current miners of the BitTube cryptocurrency, with no middleman taking a cut. Even if the publisher hasn't signed up yet, his tube will be put into a dedicated wallet that he can claim upon sign-up. You can also use your tube to tip publishers and even purchase products. Airtime monetizes users and publishers with no ads or crypto miners. Go to airtime.bogosity.tv and start making money now. And now an update in the Craig Wright saga, the only man on the planet positively confirmed not to be Satoshi Nakamoto, creator of Bitcoin, despite his claims to the contrary. Now, apparently, he just inadvertently admitted to being the hacker behind the Mt. Gox attack, back in 2011 when almost 80,000 Bitcoin were stolen, worth well over $700 million today. In a letter to Blockstream, the current developers of the Bitcoin Core software, an address beginning with 1FEEX, known as the 1FEEX address, is properly owned by Craig Wright. That's the address that received the stolen funds from Mt. Gox. Decrypt.co received a copy of the letter and confirmed its authenticity. Former Mt. Gox CEO Mark Carpellis tweeted, the 1FX address contains about 80,000 Bitcoin stolen from Mt. Gox in March 2011. Craig Wright is claiming to have been in control of this address until recently, admitting legal liability for damages and interest? Monero developer Ricardo Spogni was more direct. Just so we're clear, Craig Wright has just openly admitted via his lawyers to be the guy that stole 80,000 Bitcoin from Mt. Gox. The screenshots below show the court documents indicating the 1VX address is where the stolen Mt. Gox funds were sent. The really weird part is, Wright claims that the private keys for that address were stolen from him in a hack, and he wants Blockstream to do something about it. Quote, Tulip and Dr. Wright believe that, as those responsible for the Bitcoin Core blockchain, BTC, you have duties in relation to transactions on that blockchain in circumstances where you have notice of the interests involved, including in particular avoiding illegitimate transactions being entered on the blockchain where you have notice of the same. Hey, fake Toshi, if you were really the creator of Bitcoin, you'd know that's impossible. The blockchain is verified not by Blockstream, but by a decentralized network of nodes and miners worldwide. Short of a 51% attack moving the coins to an address of rights without proper authentication, there's nothing that can be done. The letter also laughingly states, we also act for Dr. Craig Wright, the individual behind the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto, the creator of Bitcoin. Well, hey, we needed a good laugh after everything that's been going on. But the letter specifically said that Wright and his firm Tulip Trading Limited are the legal owner of the 1FX address. Sorry, not Toshi, but as everyone who actually knows about cryptocurrency is fond of saying, not your keys, not your coins. He's trying to make human law superior to mathematical law, and in the process, just might have admitted to a pretty severe hack. The saga continues. If you're on the Wi-Fi in a coffee shop or hotel, anyone on that network can get your traffic. Do you really trust all of those strangers? For that matter, do you really trust your ISP? A VPN can protect you from prying eyes, disguise your location, and even foil government sensors. It's essential in this day and age. So go to vpn.pagosity.tv and you'll be taken to BoxPN. Starting at just $2.99 a month, you can get unlimited high-speed connections to VPN servers all over the world. And they don't log connections, so your privacy is assured. Traveling abroad, just VPN home, and don't worry about what those other governments are doing. Back at home, stop your ISP from traffic shaping and messing with the quality internet access you're paying good money for. 
You can connect from multiple machines at once, including your smartphone or tablet, and it supports all the secure standards, including OpenVPN and SSTP. Bypass sensors and surveillance with your own secure VPN connection. Go to vpn.pagosity.tv. In other cryptocurrency news, Estonia is also trying to make human law superior to math by canceling the licenses of 500 crypto outlets because of a $220 billion scandal that had nothing to do with cryptocurrency. The scandal involved Danish banking and insurance company Danske Bank, and last year Estonia closed down all of Danske Bank's operations in Estonia after a three-year investigation into illegal money laundering that's been described as the largest money laundering scandal in the history of Europe, possibly even the world. So wait a minute. Traditional lenders laundered money through the banks, and this means you need to crack down on cryptocurrencies? Huh? It resulted in the arrest of 10 former employees and Estonia seizing all of Danske Bank's assets in the country, as well as other arrests in Denmark and the resignation of CEO Thomas Borgen. It faces fines of several billion dollars to financial regulators in Europe and the U.S. So Estonian financial authorities are turning to crypto exchanges, shutting down over a third of them based on the fear that they, too, could engage in money laundering. Hey, morons, I don't think that's how the law is supposed to work. Madias Ryman, head of the Estonian Financial Intelligence Unity, said that the crackdown was a preemptive strike. So I guess pre-crime is a thing now. Someone else who saw Minority Report and fell asleep in the last 10 minutes. Estonia has also passed laws making it more difficult to obtain a crypto license. It now takes 3 months and 3,000 euros, whereas before it took 30 days and just 300 euros. They'll also need to either incorporate in the country or open an Estonian branch. Ryman warned that over half the remaining companies might be shut down as well since they don't actually operate in Estonia and their managers are outside the country. But this goes exactly to what we've been saying all along. Why is there all this panic about cryptocurrency being used for money laundering when by far it's government fiat, dollars and euros, that launderers keep using? And using the very banking systems cryptocurrency was invented to make obsolete. Or is this just another excuse to regulate crypto and grab a bunch of cash? We live in a world where light bulbs connect to the internet, and recent attacks on them prove that your online security is under threat like never before. Not only your websites, but the internet-enabled devices you buy. And the biggest problem is weak passwords. That's why you need LastPass. LastPass allows you to randomly generate strong, unique passwords on the web and on your internet-enabled devices, all protected by one master password. LastPass sets up in minutes and gives you secure automatic logins throughout the web, synchronizing across all your browsers, all your computers, and even your mobile devices, at home, at work, or on the road. It even securely stores sensitive form data, including credit card numbers, backup sensitive documents, software licenses, Wi-Fi logins, and more. And with LastPass Premium, you can get these benefits on other applications, manage passwords for your entire family, and also get priority customer support. Sign up at password.bogosity.tv for a free month of LastPass Premium. Log in securely everywhere using the last password you'll ever have to remember. Go to password.bogosity.tv and get LastPass now. And now it's time to vulcanize this week's biggest bogan emitter. And this week, it goes to the state of Maryland for virtue signaling about George Floyd and other instances of police abuse while ignoring a brutal killing by their own cops. Last year, 21-year-old Duncan Limp was shot in his bed while he slept when a Montgomery County SWAT team, prior to entry on a no-knock raid, fired through his bedroom window. They then stormed the house using flashbangs to intimidate his mother and his pregnant girlfriend. They handcuffed them while Limp bled out on his bed. None of them rendered assistance. This has all the hallmarks of a summary execution. Limp was an IT guy who was volunteering his time to help gun rights organizations set up secure websites and communications. 
Officers shouted at family members that everything they said and did was being recorded. But they don't seem to want to turn over those recordings to the family's attorney, Renee Sandler. She has requested any recordings and body camera footage taken of the event to Prosecutor Haley Roberts, to Chief Executive Mark Elrich, and Police Chief Marcus Jones, and has received no response from any of them. And Roberts even threatened to arrest Lemp's parents if they attended a protest over his killing. But a couple of weeks ago, Elrich wrote in a Washington Post op-ed, quote, The killings committed by members of the police force are truly horrible, without justification, often explained away, and seldom punished appropriately. Chief Jones issued a joint statement with other chiefs saying, we are angry and outraged over the killing of George Floyd by police officers in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We realize that we must work towards greater transparency and accountability in order to hold the public trust. Okay, so why don't you look at the ones that your police officers did? Why do you guys have all this time to grandstand in front of the press about actions of other states' police forces, but can't seem to find the time to deal with your own? Similar statements were made by Maryland Attorney General Brian Frosch and the Montgomery County Council. None of them have replied to any journalist requests for statements about the limp shooting. There's also been no reaction from the council's public safety committee. We don't even know the name of the officer who fired the shot that killed Limp. A couple of other notes. The media is ignoring it too, and Limp was white. Make of that what you will. So all of that makes Maryland this week's biggest bogan emitter. I want to tell you about the eyeglasses I've been wearing for years. As people can see on my videos, I have a very strong prescription, which makes glasses more expensive, especially when I need computer glasses, reading glasses, prescription sunglasses, and most expensively, progressive lenses for general everyday wear. To save money while still getting quality glasses, I get them from Fermu. In fact, I just got a pair of progressives with high-index aspherical lenses and a nice pair of frames my wife loves for just over $100. It would have been $500 to get them through my eye doctor. Not only do they look good, the glasses are durable. I've worn many pairs for several years without problems. All orders come with a 30-day return policy, a 3-month warranty, and one-on-one -on -one customer service. Go to Firmu, that's F-I-R-M-O-O dot Bogosity dot TV, anytime you need quality glasses at a low price. Once again, that's Firmu dot Bogosity dot TV. And now let's pre-nominate this week's... Idiot And this week, it goes to Nancy Pelosi, along with several other virtue-signaling politicians, for showing their usual sociopathy and using George Floyd's tragic and horrible murder as an opportunity to make themselves look like they care. They went to Emancipation Hall for a photo op and got on one knee for 8 minutes and 46 seconds, the same amount of time Floyd was being tortured to death. What recreating the position of the torturer and murderer is supposed to do, I have no idea. They did so while wearing an African cloth over their shoulders, so it was cultural appropriation as well. Hey, I'm just going by their standards! But the real fail is, the scarf was a pattern known as a Kent cloth, or a Nuentoma. It's a traditional textile of the Akan people of Ghana, specifically one worn by royalty and priests. How telling. The Akans dominated the region mostly because of their dominance of gold mining. This was known as the Empire of Ashanti, which ruled from about 1700 to 1900. The Ashanti waged wars on neighboring states to capture people and use them as slaves in the gold fields, as well as on farms and for other labor such as forest clearing. And they were the ones who supplied the Europeans with slaves. It seems to be a modern myth that West Africans were just happily hunting small game and foraging peacefully to themselves when all of a sudden white men came up behind them, bonked them on the head, and dragged them off to be slaves. Not so. They were already slaves of the Ashanti Empire, and the Europeans just bought them, exchanging things like gold and firearms for them. 
According to the BBC, the Ashanti were selling some 7,000 slaves a year to the Europeans. And this is the thing about it that I don't really get. Why do they get to wear this cloth, but flying the Confederate flag is racist? No consistency whatsoever. As for the inevitable excuses that follow these revelations, consider what the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel wrote. Although Kent Cloth does have ties to slavery, it's more widely recognized as a modern symbol of pride in African-American culture and pride in cultural ties to West Africa. Sound familiar? Let's rephrase. Although the Confederate flag does have ties to slavery, it is more widely recognized as a modern symbol of Southern culture and pride in cultural ties to Southern America. What's the difference, people? So that makes Nancy Pelosi, as well as the Journal Sentinel and all these other virtue signaling sociopaths, this week's Idiot Extraordinary! Well, that wraps up this If Money Can't Buy Happiness, I Guess I'll Have to Rent It edition of the Bogosity Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please keep this podcast going by subscribing and supporting in one of several different ways you can find at donate.bogosity.tv, including PayPal, cryptocurrency, or subscribing at Patreon or Subscribestar to listen early and ad-free. Also, please come to discord.bogosity.tv where you can join the discussion and post a question, statement, news article, or rant. Thank you for listening. Remember, no podcast for two weeks. Until then, here's a quote from Thomas Sowell. What multiculturalism boils down to is that you can praise any culture in the world except Western culture, and you cannot blame any culture in the world except Western culture. The Bogosity Podcast is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution on Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. Ads are annoying, but ad blockers prevent publishers from making money. What if you could support your favorite websites, YouTube creators, Twitch streamers, social accounts, and many more ad-free and without paying anything, and even make some money yourself? It's not a pipe dream, it's airtime. Go to airtime.bogosity.tv and get the browser extension, and you'll earn cryptocurrency for the sites you visit, and so will the publisher. This is not a crypto miner. You and the publisher will both get part of the reward from current miners of the BitTube cryptocurrency, with no middleman taking a cut. Even if the publisher hasn't signed up yet, his tube will be put into a dedicated wallet that he can claim upon sign-up. You can also use your tube to tip publishers and even purchase products. Airtime monetizes users and publishers with no ads or crypto miners. Go to airtime.bogosity.tv and start making money now.